In this video, we'll go over 10 cards which have confusing card text because they are either a ruling's nightmare or just have a mouthful of text that requires a few readings to understand what it actually does. And at number 10, we have the Twin-Headed Behemoth. Now, this card actually got an errata to change its wording because its original version caused a lot of confusion that was so bad it got put on the limited list because of its wording. What this card does is during the end phase, if this card is in the graveyard because it was destroyed on the field, you can special summon this card, but its attack and defense become 1000, and you can only use this effect once per duel. Now, its original card also had the same effect, but it had a wording on it which read, you can only use the effect of each twin-headed behemoth once per duel, whereas its effect nowadays reads, you can only use this effect of twin-headed behemoth once per duel. Now, the wording on this is what caused a lot of confusion with its ruling, as this was the first ever card in the game with a once per duel effect. And based on the wording, each individual copy of Twin-Headed Behemoth had their own once per duel effect. So, you could use three copies of these effects once per duel, instead of just the effect one time per duel, based on each copy of the card. But this caused a whole bunch of ruling nightmares of keeping track of which cards were in the graveyard, and which already activated their effects previously in the duel, as well as things like what happens if you shuffle it into the deck, do you get another once per duel, does it remember if it already happened, and a whole bunch of other things like that. And because of this, this card was added to the limited list. Not because it was a powerful card, but to solve a lot of the rulings problems that this card created. And eventually, they changed this card to its modern day version of only allowing you to use the effect of the card once per duel and was one of the earliest versions of the hard once per turn effects, even if it was technically applied to a once per duel effect. And at number 9, we have Power Frame. This card has the effect where, if a face-up monster you control is targeted for an attack by a monster with a higher attack, you can target the attack target, then apply these following effects. Negate the attack, and if that attack is negated, you can equip this card to that target, and then the equipped monster gains attack equal to the difference between its attack and the attack of its attacker when this card resolves. Now, even trying to simplify that, it's still kind of confusing to understand what this card actually does. So let me break it down in much more simpler terms. Basically, if one of your monsters is being attacked by an opponent's monster who has a higher attack than your monster, you can negate that attack and then your monster will gain attack points in order to be equal to your opponent's monster's attack points. And then this card will be equipped to your monster. That's all it does. It stops an attack and then gives one of your monsters an attack boost. This one falls squarely into the category of you have to read this card a few times to understand what it actually does. And at number 8 we have Magnet Reverse. This card has an effect where you can special summon one machine or rock type monster that is either banished or in your graveyard, as long as it has the condition where it cannot be normal summoned or set. Now here's the confusing thing about this card, is what exactly can it target? Every single extra deck monster cannot be normal summoned or set, but none of them say that they can't be normal summoned or set on them. Yet Magnet Reverse does work on those cards. You just have to know that it does. But not all of them, because some of them say that they cannot be special summoned except from their respective extra deck summoning method. Except in cases which this card would target them, like with XYZ Dragon Cannon, who states it must first be special summoned from the extra deck and cannot be special summoned from the graveyard. But it can be special summoned if it's banished, which means you can use Magnet Reverse to special summon it from the banished zone but only if it was sent there directly from the field. So, if you properly summon XYZ Dragon Cannon, and then it goes to the graveyard, and then you banish it from the graveyard, you cannot then use Magnet Reverse to special summon the card. It would have been sent to the banished zone directly from the field. Kind of the same case as Valkyrion the Magnet Warrior. It states it must first be special summoned from your hand, and that it cannot be normal summoned or sent. So if you send this card directly from your hand or deck to the graveyard, you can't use Magnet Reverse to bring it out. But if you properly summon it first, and then it goes to the graveyard, then you can use Magnet Reverse to bring it out. 
unless it gets banished from the graveyard, in which case you can no longer use Magnet Reverse to bring it out because it doesn't remember that it was brought out properly first. You just kind of have to know all of these rulings and what you can and cannot use Magnet Reverse to bring out, and from where you can and cannot bring monsters back from. The card itself isn't very confusing, it's more of the fact of all the targets for it, and where you have to just know the rulings for these kinds of things. And at number 7, we have Vicious Claw. This is an equip card which does a lot of things and has a lot of words in order to describe a pretty simple effect. Basically what it does is while it's equipped, that monster gains 300 attack. Pretty simple attack boost. Then if the monster this card is equipped to would be destroyed by battle, Instead of that monster being destroyed, you can return this card to your hand instead. Then, you can destroy one monster on the field, except the monster which battled the monster who had this card equipped to it. So, you can destroy another one of your opponent's monsters, or even destroy one of your own monsters. But that's not it. You also get to inflict 600 points of burn damage to your opponent after destroying a monster. And then, you give your opponent a token with 2500 attack and defense. And then it also has a restriction where you cannot use this card from your hand for the rest of the turn. This one falls into the category of a card which just has a mouthful of attacks doing a whole bunch of different things. It gives an attack boost, it offers battle protection to a monster, it destroys a monster, it inflicts burn damage, it special summons a token for your opponent, it returns to your hand, and it has a once per turn clause. Very convoluted equip spell that's uh, honestly not very good. And at number 6, we have Mystical Ref Panel. This card has an effect where, if a spell card that targets one player is activated, the effect of that spell card is instead applied to the other player. Now, what's confusing about this card is what exactly does this even work on? Because most spell cards don't say that they target a player. So knowing which spell cards this effect actually works on kind of falls into the category of a magnet reverse, where you just have to know. This card does work on some really negative spell effects, like the Humble Sentry or Cold Feet, two spell cards which only provide negative effects for you, so you can use Mystical Rep Panel in order to force your opponent to have these effects instead, of revealing their hand and then returning one card back to their deck, or locking them out of spell and traps for a turn. If your opponent tries to draw cards, deal life point damage, increase their life points, cause a player to discard, or modify the actions that a player can do, then usually you can use Mystical Ref Panel on it. Like for example, if they activate Pot of Desires. You can use Mystical Ref Panel in order to draw two cards for yourself while your opponent pays the cost. Then there's lots of other cards it doesn't work on, like Upstart Goblin, because that card has effects that affect both players by drawing a card and having your opponent gain 1000 life points. Or it also can't be used on cards like Raigeki or Harpy's Feather Duster since I guess they target your opponent's field and not the player, so you just kind of have to know which cards technically target players and which cards technically don't. This card is just confusing on the rulings level, as it requires a lot of innate knowledge to use it effectively. And at number 5, we have Kotodama. This is one where its original card text was kind of confusing, and then it got an errata in order to make its text a little bit more clear, and it even added parentheses to explain what the effect actually does which is really rare in Yu-Gi-Oh. That's how you know you have a confusing card tax when it adds extra effects to tell you what the effect does. So basically, what this card does is while it's face-up on the field, face-up monsters who share the same name on the field are destroyed. So, if you summon a monster who shares the same name as another monster on the field, the new monster will be destroyed, and the original one will get to stay on the field, even though the card says it destroys all of them. And this kind of brings up some rules you just have to know about its effect. Like, if you summon this card and your opponent already controls two monsters of the same name, both of those cards will be destroyed immediately. But if one is flip summoned or summoned in another way later on, only the new card will be destroyed and the original gets to stay on the field. If two or more cards are summoned at the same time, of the same name, they get destroyed immediately. And if your opponent tries to prevent the destruction with something like My Body as a Shield, it won't work because its effects are considered continuous and happens immediately without a chain, which means this effect can be used during the damage step, and at any other time without giving your opponent a window of opportunity in order to negate it. Now, Kotodama's original wording said, As long as this card remains face up on the field, monsters of the same name cannot exist on the field at the same time. And then it goes on to say that if a card of the same name is summoned in a later turn, 
that card is destroyed. So it just says cards cannot exist at the same time, but it never actually gives a penalty until the next line, which applies on the next turn? Its original text was very old school Yu-Gi-Oh, and its new text actually makes a little bit more sense, and just requires you to know a little bit of extra rulings for how its effect actually applies. But I think it's a perfect addition to this list of confusing card texts. And at number 4, we have Grave Robber. This one has what seems like a pretty simple effect, but then falls into the category of just having to know a whole bunch of other hidden rules in order to make best use of the card. The effect is to select one spell card from your opponent's graveyard, and then you can use it as your hand until the end of the turn. And if you use it, you take 2,000 points of damage. Now, it's the wording of use it as your hand that makes this kind of confusing. Because does that mean you use it as if the card was in your hand? Or do you use the effect from your opponent's graveyard and just consider it as if it was in your hand? Well, according to its official ruling, you do get to add that spell card to your hand and it's sent back to your opponent's graveyard at the end of the turn, unless you get rid of it before then. But even if you set the card in the field, it still gets set back to your opponent's graveyard. And also, its burn damage does not start a chain, so you can't chain something like Barrel Behind the Door to the burn damage in order to not take it. But continuous effects like Death's Wombat will prevent the damage. And at number 3, we have Silent Wobby. This card has an effect that allows you to special summon it to your opponent's side of the field, but it also has an effect when summoned, which affects both players, which really makes its effect kind of confusing, unless you read the effect really closely. So first off, its effect states during your main phase, you can special summon this card from your hand to your opponent's side of the field. And this is its first effect, even though its second one immediately follows the sentence, basically this is the end of its first effect. Now that this card exists on your opponent's side of the field, this next effect will apply, where it states, when summoned this way, you get to draw one card. And if you do, your opponent gains 2,000 life points. Now, even though this was your card that you gave to your opponent, you're not the one who activates this effect. Your opponent is the one who is being forced to activate this effect on their side of the field. And because of that, they read that card effect from their point of view. So they will be the one to draw one card, and if they draw that card, then you, the person who gave the card to them will gain 2,000 life points. And it also has a continuous effect where the hand size limit to the person who controls this card becomes 3 instead of 6. So basically what this card does for you is gives your opponent a monster and then you gain 2,000 life points. Whereas your opponent will be able to draw a card and have a monster on their side of the field who they can use for link plays or attribute summits. But if it stays out, they will have a hand size limit of 3. And this card's effects are perfectly reasonable and within line of good problem-solving card text. It's just, I had to even look up its effect to make sure I got it right for this video, because even I wasn't too confident in getting its effect right. And at number 2, we have Pole Position. Pole Position is a card in Yu-Gi-Oh! which causes the most amount of illegal plays possible out of any other card. Basically, there's this hidden ruling in Yu-Gi-Oh! where if you would use a card that would cause an infinite loop in gameplay, which doesn't result in a net loss or gain, then the move which made that infinite loop possible would be an illegal move, and you'd have to just turn back the time and undo it. Although pole position causes so many infinite loops that they created a new ruling just for it, where if it causes an involuntary infinite loop, it just destroys itself instead. Now, what this card does is pretty simple. The monster on the field with the highest attack is unaffected by the effects of spell cards. And also, if pole position is removed from the field, it destroys the monster on the field with the highest attack. Now, how this causes infinite loops mainly comes down to spell cards which increase the attack and defense, usually in the form of equip cards, continuous, or field spell cards. Where, for example, if you have the warrior monster, Elemental Hero Stratos on the field with 1800 attack, and you have the field spell card Sojin, which would increase its attack by 200, and it was the highest attack on the field, Pole Position would choose that Stratos as the highest attack monster on the field, and make it immune to spells. So, its attack would then drop down to 1800. But, if there was another card on the field with an attack in between 1800 to 2000, like 1900 for example, then Pole Position would make Stratos immune to spells. Then, after Pole Position makes Stratos immune to spells, that new 1900 attack monster would be the highest attack on the field. And then it would gain Pole Position's immunity, removing the immunity from Stratos 
who would then gain 200 due to the effect of the field spell card, and would have 2000 attack, and be the highest attack monster on the field, and then it would be chosen for pole position, and then become immune and go back down to 1800, and then we repeat. Pole position would just choose a 1900 attack monster, then go back to Stratos, then back to the 1900 attack monster, it would just continue infinitely with no net change in game state. And in that scenario, pole position would just destroy itself based on the hitting ruling you just have to know about. Or you wouldn't be allowed to make a play which would cause that loop to happen in the first place. And that's just one example, as there are many other examples I can give for how pole position likes to screw the rules. And there's even some examples in which it's impossible to prevent pole position from causing infinite loops. So you wouldn't even be able to not play a card which is why pole position has its own rulings of destroying itself. And finally, at number one, we have Inspector Border. Not really because it's the most confusing card on this list, but because it's the most used card on this list, which also just happens to have a confusing effect. This card can only be normal or special summoned as long as you do not control another monster. And while it's on the field, neither player can activate a monster effect, unless the number of monster effects the player has previously activated that turn is less than the number of card types currently on the field. And card types refer to Ritual, Fusion, Synchro, Exceeds, Pendulum, and Link monsters. And it's also another card with parentheses to add a little bit more to its effect, to clarify that negated effects don't count towards this total, and to only count effects that were activated while this card was phased up on the field. So you don't count effects which happened before this card became phased up on the field. So, what exactly does this effect do? Well, its effect is much more simple to grasp if you break it down into a few parts. Number 1. Once Inspector Border hits the field, you start counting monster effects for both players. Number 2. Once a monster is on the field of one of the types from Inspector Border's effect, Ritual, Fusion, Synchro, Exceeds, Pendulum, or Link, both players will be able to activate one monster effect per turn. Number 3. All of these special card types need to be on the field at the same time, in order to have more effects to activate. Number four, if you have one link monster on the field, both players get one effect. If that link monster goes away, and there is now only an exceeds monster on the field, both players do not gain another effect. They still only have one to use. Number five, so if you use an effect while you had a link monster route, and now it's gone, and you now control an exceeds monster in this example, you do not get to use another effect, as you have already used your one effect for that turn. Number six, if there are no special types of monsters on the field, you cannot activate hand traps, as those count as monster effects, even if they don't activate on the field, as Inspector Border stops all monster effects, no matter where they take place. And it's that last point that people use Inspector Border for in the first place, is its ability to shut down hand traps. Specter Border is usually only used in anti-meta decks anyway, but it is a pretty good anti-meta card, with good stats, an easy summoning condition, and a good lockdown, as it forces your opponent to try to special summon in order to be able to use their monster effects, even if the effects of the card are kind of confusing to understand. All right, and that's it for the video. If you know of any other confusing cards that should have made this list, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, as well as ideas for future videos just like this one.